Welcome everyone to the Reuters set uh, here in Davos. Uh, this is for the Answers on video series. I'm delighted to, uh, to be joined by Sylvain Duranton, senior partner and MD at the Boston Consulting Group. Welcome, Sylvain, and Brian Peccarelli, uh, COO, uh, Customer Markets for Thomson Reuters. Um, to both of you, welcome. Sylvain, let me kick it off with you. You, you run the team at BGC that, 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 that builds out AI solutions for clients. Uh, we talked with a, another guest on, on this series about AI being the star, uh, the star guest, if you like, here in Davos. Would you agree with that? I guess that's what you want to hear. <laughs> yes, clearly, um, AI is a star guest and talked about everywhere today. And I feel this is a bit of a paradox, by the way, because it's talked about everywhere. But in reality, we surveyed companies worldwide with MIT. And it's only 20% of companies who have really managed to bring some powerful AI solutions at scale. For most of companies, this is either wondering what to do or discovering. And is that fear there? Do you think fear is part of that? I think fear is clearly part of that, but also lack of investment under those initiatives. And AI is sometimes seen too much as, you know, an additional IT project and given, you know, to uh, CIOs to push. Mm. Whereas it's much broader than that. This is, of course, about tech, but about people, about processes and it needs very strong senior management endorsement to go through. Brian, Thomson Reuters is, is jumping into this space fast, and, and we use this in a, in a number of our, our products. I mean, my feeling is, as, as Sylvain was saying, if, if, if only 20% of companies, I mean, that, that seems remarkable to me, because it would seem to be that the 80% are without a doubt gonna be left behind. Well, well uh, uh, what I've seen, it has been talked about the last several years here in, in, in Davos. I think, uh, you know, it's much more prevalent this year because there's some real examples of, of AI in action now. I know for ourselves, it took several years of hard work to figure out the right mix of kind of the AI, the technology itself, but, but marrying it with the data, and you need vast amounts of data, you know, and then that domain expertise to actually do the training to have predictable results that you can rely on. I know it took us a while to figure out what's that right mix, but now we're coming out with products, we have solutions in the marketplace, and we're accelerating rapidly, but it took a learning curve. Yeah, give, it, give us some examples, Brian, of, of where we you put this into practice most effectively. So, so Westlaw Edge is a, a new product for us in the, the legal space. And, and it's really put it to practical usage where it's at advancing. It's taking uh, not only time out of the, the research and, and, and preparation time uh, for attorneys, but it's also having uh, better predictable results and giving that at their, at their fingertips, um, wh which is just a fantastic combination. And the uptick has been tremendous um, in the response. Uh, from the, the legal market. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you, Sylvain, in just a second, but I, I also wanted to ask you, Brian, what role AI will play in the audit space, you know, when we look at our tax and accounting business. So I think there's been lots of activity going on for several years in that, from not only the big four focusing on it and trying to improve things, we've been focused on it for other customers, um, you know, and, and trying to do things in, in mass for them to improve the space. Uh, there's products and solutions coming out right now that are advancing it. I think you're, you're going to see continued advancement. Again, as the training is there and as the better predictable results come, I think that okay. kind of is the audit of the future. So, Sivan, let's get your sense of where this is used most effectively, AI, uh, in business, which sectors, which countries, which governments uh, are, are embracing this and, and, and prepared to back it. And, and, and so who's best in class and who's worst in class, according to BGC? So um, worldwide, we see two industries ahead of the pack. One is technology, media, and telecom, quite obviously, and the other one is energy where there is a lot to do to improve the management of assets, the management of the large grids. If you take more uh, country perspective, uh, China is clearly ahead with Singapore also, two very advanced countries. Then we have the Anglo-Saxon world, Canada, America, UK, and then Europe is clearly lagging behind, mm. mostly probably due to cultural barriers uh, to the new agile world and the traditional European engineering culture 
doesn't fit very well with the way AI solutions are deployed. Am I, am I being fair when I say it's, it's a lot of the consultancies, and I'm not sure if BGC is in, included here, but the McKinsey's and the, uh, and, and the Edelman Trust Barometers who, who, who are doing a lot of the scaremongering about AI, you know, saying 50% of the jobs or 60% of the jobs are going to go. Um, what are we going to do about it? When in actual fact, yes, while that number of jobs might go, we're gonna, it's going to create a whole lot more, right, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we've always seen this movement in the, it, with jobs and, and jobs change. You know, certain jobs have gone away for, for decades and been replaced with other jobs. We see huge shortages today in the AI, in the tech space of jobs where some other jobs are, are going away. So I think we all have to get together and figure out how does that retraining, how, how uh, is the workforce prepared for the new jobs of tomorrow? And I think there's less fear about no jobs in tomorrow. It's just new jobs. Okay. What, what's your take on this, Ivan? I, I fully agree with this. I think the 50% number is out of whack for the short term and working with companies in the real world. When you look at reskilling, you might be talking about 5 or 10% of the workforce, basically. And most of the real AI initiatives aim at more effective decision making, better pricing decisions, better stock allocation decisions, better push of personalized offer to client, better, you know, medical treatment protocol for patients. Mm -hmm. And not so much about, you know, uh, you know, killing jobs. And when we look in hindsight, you know, on the, the initiatives launched by companies, 80% of them are geared toward effectiveness mm -hmm. and only 20% uh, to efficiency. And I imagine that resonates with you, Brian, because that's the sort of thing we're using it for in, in TR, I imagine. Uh, correct. I mean, it, 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 it's augmenting that work. It's, it, it's making it better what people are doing. It's not replacing what they're doing. And I think that's an important distinction. I think that's uh, been a learning curve that we've gone through the last several years from the original thought that it could replace everybody and kind of the, the robots of the future running everything too, it can make everybody much more productive, you know, uh, much better decision making. And I think that's key. Yeah. We can be much more efficient that way. Okay. Brian Peccarelli, Sylvain Duranton, thank you very much to both of you. Uh, that's it for uh, Answers On. Uh, do stay tuned for uh, all the other interviews we're doing here out of Davos. I'm Axel Threlfall for Reuters.